Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sam Brookhouse, and welcome back to the Class Play on the Sumer Sports Show. For the next few weeks leading up to the draft, the Class Play is going to focus on the top four quarterbacks expected to define this draft class. These podcasts will be companion pieces to our tour of the top four written pieces, which you can find on sumersports.com. This week, our spotlight is on the quarterback currently rated as four by the Grinding the Mocks, Michigan's J.J. McCarthy. Tej, thanks for joining me. I'm excited to talk more. How you doing, man? Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm really excited to talk about this fantastic four of quarterbacks I think that you have set up. It's, it's going to be really fun these next couple of weeks to talk about all of them. And you picked a, a good one today to, to start off with. For sure. And as always, uh, to everyone in the crowd, if you're listening live, make sure to follow or subscribe us on social media and always ask questions in the chat. We love as much participation as possible. So before we jump into the J.J. McCarthy of it all, let's kind of do a high level look at some quarterbacks that may be under the radar. Tej, who's kind of a quarterback that you see out there who may not be in this top four that may have an impact uh, moving forward in, in his NFL career? <laughs> yeah, so we joke about this guy a lot, but I, I mean, I do generally mean this in sense where I, I really like Spencer Rattler. Um, you know, he would be my QB five if if I was ranking quarterbacks in this draft. And I think that there there are like pretty obvious things with Spencer Rattler to like. You think about how he was a five star recruit and has played in multiple offenses in college. He has the arm strength. He has the ability to to kind of move around a offensive line. Um, you know, a pocket where an offensive line was not good last year. South Carolina played a different offensive line combination in ten out of their twelve games. He was the highest. Uh, pressured quarterback out of any quarterback in the top eight per stats bomb data. So like he, he still was able to be relatively efficient. Despite that, I think he only had one real receiver he was throwing to in, in Xavier Legat, who, who had his fifth year breakout, I think in a large part because of what Rattler was able to do down the field. So, you know, I, I really like Rattler. I've had some friends at teams that have, have expressed similar, um, you know, a, a likeness to, to Rattler. So I'm, I'm excited to see where he ends up going in this draft. Yeah, and I think one of the most interesting things about Spencer Rattler, obviously we talked about this a lot last week and in the past weeks, is that he's another one of those transfer quarterbacks, but he's a transfer quarterback who, you know, had snaps, had reps at Oklahoma, goes to South Carolina, which obviously wasn't as great of a situation and also probably had better competition. And he performed well and, and worked himself into what was at one point, you know, he was looked at as like a QB one, QB two, very, very early on his, in his career. That's what he was projected to be um, to a guy that when he transferred, a lot of people were very low on, didn't know if it was going to translate to the SEC, thought moving to a team that didn't have quite the talent that an Oklahoma team may have had, may not have lived up to it. Um, and he's he's ended up doing very well for himself. And and I've seen a lot of noise about him recently in the media. And it's going to be exciting to see where he ends up landing. Um, my player in terms of this is not exactly in Tej's kind of QB5 land. I think he's probably a guy that you could probably get in the fifth or sixth or seventh round. But I think he can make a pretty big impact, especially long term. I'm interested to see, you know, three, four, five years down the line where he kind of ends up. Uh, in terms of the NFL hierarchy is Jordan Travis coming from Florida State. You know, I talk, I've, I've talked about how much I love the Florida State team and how I'm excited. I think a lot of them are going to be good NFL players. Um, Travis was a consistent player who was the star of a, of a team that was pretty consistently undervalued. And even when they were undefeated, they were undervalued, not put in the college football playoff. And so, I mean, he hits markers in terms of advanced stats. He's not going to like blow you out of the water like a guy like Jane Daniels might in terms of his QBR uh, on ESPN or, you know, super high EPA player or anything like that. But decent pressure to sack ratio, pretty good big time throw ratio, you know, a top 15 QBR on ESPN doesn't take a, a lot of bad sacks, doesn't lose a lot of expected points on sacks. I, I think he could be an interest late in the draft. Uh uh, obviously, you don't want to bring up Purdy because it's a it's such a, a outlier at this point, you know, being the last pick of the draft. But I could see someone making an investment, you know, uh, in a similar situation that the 49ers were in when they took Purdy and that, you know, this is a player that's played a lot of snaps uh, and most of those snaps ended up pretty well. And, and he won a lot of games. Maybe we bring him in as like a QB three 
practice squad guy and 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 give him some reps uh, in training camp and see if if he's a good player. And and I expect him long term to be, if not a solid backup for ten plus years, at least being an okay. Uh, excuse me, if if not that, he I think he could get all the way up to an okay starter and maybe someone who who has a progression like a Geno Smith or, or somebody like that long term. So shifting. So looking at uh, Asa, thank you, Asa, for the question. What do you think Travis's round projection would be if he were healthy? Tough to say. Tej, any thoughts on that? That's a really good question. Um, you know, I've, I've thought about this with like with with someone like Travis, someone like Jonathan Brooks. And I think that, you know, I was thinking about some players that kind of had to had injuries late in in the season, in the college football season that were in the draft. And I think about someone like Jameson Williams who was talked about as maybe being the wide receiver one in that class if there was no injury, um, you know, and ended up having to, to sit out most of his rookie year and drop down to the, I believe, the wide receiver four in that class. So I think that there will be that discount with someone like Travis, where if he was healthy, you know, maybe you're, you're looking at fourth, fifth round for him. And now there's like a round discount because, uh, you know, because of his injury and, and when it happened in the season. Yeah, I tend to agree with that. And and sometimes you even see this in fantasy, obviously, where, you know, players who are injured or suspended drop in terms of a fantasy draft uh, and end up being very productive players. And I think, obviously, especially at the quarterback position, um, a player like Travis in the real NFL draft um, is subject to that. And I totally agree with your analysis there. Um, so moving into our meat and potatoes today, moving into J.J. McCarthy, let's just start the highest level you can possibly get, Tej. If you had to describe McCarthy in one word, what would that word be? <laughs> this is a this is a great topic. Uh, the one word that I have for JJ McCarthy is polarizing. So there's really two ways to look at JJ McCarthy. Um, you know, some of some people that are lower on him will reference this a lot. He had a 46.2 percent usage rate, which was the lowest among the top eight quarterbacks in this class per stats bomb data. So you know, out of all the team's plays, he was only throwing, uh, you know, a pass or having a, a run himself on, on 46% of those plays. Just for reference, Michael Penix and Kayla Williams were at 62 and 61% respectively. So there's a huge difference in what their offenses were putting on their plate versus, uh, you know, what, what Michigan's offense was putting on JJ McCarthy's plate. And, you know, you can even reference the Penn State game where they ran the entire second half and we're still still able to win. But then there's the other side of JJ McCarthy where he was always efficient when needed to be. He got the job done multiple times. There were there were multiple games where he headed into halftime, uh, you know, losing. You think about the Illinois game in 2022, the Ohio State game in 2022, um, you know, the the uh some of the games this year where they they struggled early on and then and then ended up rolling over the opponent and you know he was able to come back in, in all of those games and, and end up winning them so it's it's easy to find things to like about him it's easy to to find things to not like about him i think he's 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 the most polarizing quarterback in this class because of that yeah i'd have to agree and you touched on kind of how michigan would run for an entire second half and still win the game that's the word that I'm going to use, and I'm not going to use it in the conventional sense, um, but I'm going to use it as something that taints his weaknesses and also, you know, shows his his strengths. And he's a winner. I mean, he's won at every level. He won state championships, runners up at, in high school, um, moved to IMG, won a national championship at the high school level, then goes on to Michigan. Um, three college football playoffs, has a, a small role um, in, in the first season, second season starts, makes it to the college football playoff, third season wins the title. There's a lot of winning that comes with J.J. McCarthy, and I think that you know shows his best strengths, which he's a team guy. Um, he has upside and knows how to win, knows how to manage games, has been in a lot of big games, uh, et cetera. However, it's his crucial downside because it adds so much uncertainty because he has been on these great powerhouse teams that have won a ton of games and he, we, he hasn't had to be used as much as some of these other quarterbacks have to do to win the same amount of games. I, I love that Pennix stat that you gave because Pennix had a road to the national championship as well. He was the main engine behind that. McCarthy, we, we don't even know if he could have been the engine to that. And, and that's, I think, the biggest thing holding him back from being a top star is that frankly, we just don't know how he would do in a situation where the talent is all even 
or his talent is not uh, substantially better than that he's facing. Um, can the intangibles transfer over? Can the leadership transfer over? It's always hard to say with that kind of stuff. Obviously, with the metrics, we have we have an idea of what transfers over, um, but with the intangibles, it's a little harder. Yeah, no, I think I think that's a great point to bring up, right? Where it's like you can't necessarily knock him completely just for the lack of usage, right? Like I think that's just kind of Harbaugh style. Like you think about the way that people are talking about the Chargers right now. Like Michigan understood they they had an advantage in the trenches. They had running backs they could count on, and like McCarthy was still able to perform when needed to be, but he didn't have to be the center of the offense, like you mentioned with Penix. But it it, it does add uncertainty into his college to pro projections, whereas you have a better feeling of what Caleb Williams, what Bo Nix, what Michael Penix will look like at the next level because we saw so many times where they did stuff that they will do in the NFL. They had games where they had like a 60% drop back rate and, and we'll see that often in the NFL. For JJ McCarthy, like it could be really, really good. Like maybe, you know, putting a, a full game on, him play, on his plate like allows him to get into rhythm. He is able to take his game to the next level because of that experience. Or, you know, maybe he he goes back to, um, you know, pr- slightly underperforming his draft position just because it's a lot for him to handle to, to put that much, uh, you know, drop back rate onto him. So you're right. Like it, it really increases the range of outcomes when you have less like NFL plays that will translate to the next level. So I, I really like that point um, and, and kind of just like thinking about him going from college to pro. Yeah. And, and I think I obviously gave the, the, the word that someone who is you know looking to jump up to get a jj mccarthy type would look at you know he's a winner that's that's what we need on our team he's a winner um but i think if if you boil it down a little bit and and what those wins and what that winning mentality and being on those winning teams actually shows i think a great other word to use would be uncertainty and so that kind of brings us into his pros and his cons his strengths and his weaknesses Tej, what do you kind of view of his pros and his cons yeah, I mean, I, I think I think the pros, um, you know, his, I think he has athletic ability. He tested really well, uh, you know, at the at the combine, especially with the the drills that matter for for quarterbacks, three cone and broad jump. I think he's also pretty accurate in general. Like going back to the stats bomb data, he was the third most accurate of the top eight quarterbacks in this draft class with a plus six point nine percent completion percentage over expected. So he did a good job of that last year. And then his toughness, I think about the specific play against Alabama where it was, it was a a flea flicker or like a kind of a a throwback to the quarterback. And he ended up catching it with, with one hand taking a hit as he threw it and ended up hitting the open receiver downfield. So like he's, he's someone that, that is definitely durable um, and and can play, you know, the, the entire season. I think, I think like he, he looks skinnier, uh, you know, on TV than he probably actually is. And I think his, his way him showed that. When you look at his cons, not much deep ball experience at all, right? Like that wasn't really part of Michigan's offense. Um, it was it was a lot of of more working in the the short and intermediate areas of the field and, and really relying on yards after catch. And again, like it goes back to our, our discussion from earlier. Like, is there a signal and volume with with how he was used in college? Um, you know, we we really haven't seen a quarterback taken in the top five not be the the focal point of their collegiate offense, um, you know, when it, when it comes to like, the, just like, again, like their usage rate and and how much they drop back. So it, it, it'll be really interesting to find out if that was more because of him, more because of the the style that was implemented in the offense. Like I'm, I'm very fascinated to see what happens at the next level. Yeah. I, I think you hit the nail on the head when I'm looking at the pros and cons uh, the intangibles are key, I, I think. And if you're a big believer in your intangibles and if, if that's your take, you want to build a value-based front office, culture-based front office that's that's bringing in players that fit in that culture, I think J.J. McCarthy is probably going to be someone who can do that. Obviously, very centered, um, can, can deal with some adversity. Uh, and obviously, he has the intangibles on the field in that he can remain poised in big games for the most part. And he can do what it takes to win that game, isn't afraid to take a back seat as he did in that, notably in that Penn State game. I think something that shockingly, I, I guess, it goes under the radar is his athleticism. I could really see him being kind of a run first quarterback when he's young, a la, you know, a, a kind of a Justin Fields per, uh, type player, kind of the way Anthony Richardson was used last year. 
Uh, Jalen Hurts was used early in his career. I, I could honestly see him doing that, especially if he's on a better team, uh, if that's it ends up being where he goes in the draft. And finally, I do think he has big time playability. Um, watching the film, there's always one or two plays that he cracks open the defense and it, and it always ends up being a big time play in the course of the game, in the flow of the game, which I think is key. That being said, his cons, I, I just think he struggles with accuracy sometimes. It, it, it's it's very interesting. And generally, we like to see accuracy. Accuracy generally does a pretty good job of moving on to the pros. However, he, he struggles with ball placement uh, sometimes. And that could be due to his mechanics. I think this is more of a coaching point than necessarily something that may stick with him, you know, six years down the road. But I think that's something that you have to be comfortable that your coaches can coach that out of a quarterback if you take J.J. McCarthy. A similar step here is his progressions. Um, I think he struggles to kind of get off of his first read sometimes. Uh, There's some things he does where he kind of bounces around in the pocket before he takes off, and it seems as if he doesn't really have a feel of what's going on on the field at at that point in time. I think that got better this year and especially as you started going into the season. Um, but that's another thing that I'd look out, out on. And then finally, that uncertainty. I think you have to be really confident that you have the organization, the players on the offense right now, and the coaching staff if you're going to go up and pick a J.J. McCarthy just because there's so much uncertainty, so much lack of volume as compared to some of the other players. Those, yeah, those are all really good points. And, yeah, I mean, I think when you when you talk about his – his progressions, his, his processing ability. Like you think about when when Michigan was was coming out of 2020, and they just had one of the the, the worst seasons in program history, really, where they they went two and four. They almost lost to Rutgers, had to cancel the last couple of games because of COVID. And you you have two new coordinators come in, and, and Matt Weiss and Mike McDonald, and Kate McNamara does start that 2021 season and Michigan's offense goes from 55th in the country to 15th because of a lot of what Matt Weiss was, was able to implement. And so then you have, you know, Cade McNamara and, and JJ McCarthy have this somewhat of a quarterback battle headed into 2022, but, but, you know, it was, it was pretty obvious that, that McCarthy was going to end up winning that. And then you can really see that the next level of the Michigan's offense go from, from McNamara to McCarthy. And, you know, you see a lot of the things that you mentioned, the athleticism, the big, big playability, like that was all there, but we don't know as much about the progressions because the offense was so well designed and so well schemed up. And you had the the pass catchers to execute it, like the, the Roman Wilson, um, you know, AJ banter types where it's like, yeah, maybe we don't know how well JJ McCarthy is at, at that processing ability yet, just because of the way that the offense was, was designed and set up for him. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I think you, you mentioned kind of a, a great overview of McCarthy's career going, you know, s- signing in 2020, coming in in 2021 and playing in 22 and 23. Out of all those seasons, what's the most intriguing game to you in terms of showing his NFL potential? Yeah, so I think that, you know, this is somewhat recency bias, but you really think about the Alabama Rose Bowl game where first play of the game, he comes out and throws what should have been an interception, you know, got a little bit lucky that the Alabama defender ended up stepping out of bounds, you know, kind of, kind of rebounds from that ends up finishing 17 for 27, three touchdowns and 91 QBR. So again, like you can see the things in that game that, that you want to like a lot about him, you know, leads a a very crucial drive in the fourth quarter to, um, you know, to, to set up Michigan to, to go to overtime and, and end up closing out that game with a win, um, you know, had some bad variants with special teams, but, but responded, but also like the offense did stall out at, at points in that game. And you're going up against Nick Saban defense with a month to repair. So that, that is expected. So like, I kind of see that as, you know, when you think about him going to the NFL, I think that there's going to be a lot of those types of games, especially against really good defenses where you see the things that, you know, you, you saw in college, the flashes, the athletic ability, um, you know, being able to to hit one or two explosives a game because of his his pocket movement and and how he's able to escape pressure, but also like there will be points where the the run game might not be working for whatever team he's on, and you know it's it's more of a struggle to to uh, generate offense. So like I think I think that was a really good showcase of what it might look like for him when he goes to the the NFL. Yeah, there there was this phrase I used in my piece, and I think you did a great job of kind of nailing down deeper into it, 
But when you look at some of the games in which McCarthy did the best, it seems as if the offense was conservative and he was productive. And I think that Bama game w- was a great one. Another one that I looked at and when I talked to some of my friends who follow Michigan very closely, they really looked at was the 23 Ohio State game. Uh, you have you have a player that goes 16 for 20 with a touchdown, 81st percentile on EPA per drop back, according to GameOnPaper.com. Um, notably, the the rush attack was not working that game, and and he kind of bore the load per se in trudging towards a win against a very good team. He had a big difficult throw that he made, tight window t- for a touchdown to Roman Wilson, and again kind of to the intangibles point and and i think that's what makes him so so intriguing to front offices and to the media is that this it was a huge win basically to send them to the college football playoff uh under duress you know jim harbaugh suspended that they have kind of new coaches taking over obviously under duress at that point i think it was the second or third game that he had been suspended but nonetheless mccarthy comes in as a leader and leads them to a big win and performs pretty well. Uh, I think it, in the best case on a good team, I think this is a, a lot of what he did versus Ohio State is what you can expect at the next level. I think on kind of a, a more chaotic view is that TCU game, which I've watched two or three times in the past week. It's a fascinating game because you know, you watch the film, he, he doesn't seem to be doing that good. He's missing a couple throws. He has two just back-breaking interceptions. But then in the aggregate, you, you start realizing he made a bunch of big plays, both through the air and on the ground. The game was out, an out-of-control game. It was all over the place. He was able to remain poised despite having two back-breaking turnovers. He, he kept Michigan in the game pretty much the whole game. And it ends up being this wild shootout I think 90 plus points were scored in the game affair where McCarthy comes out looking, you know, like an NFL quarterback, despite having kind of being the reason they may have lost throwing two pick sixes. And that's a really good game to bring up because yeah, I mean, you're right. It had everything. It was, it was very Jameis pilled. It was that game, but like you saw, you saw like a lot of, again, like the, the things like, I think it's really interesting. And like, we talked about how he's polarizing at the beginning where it's like, there's, there's a lot of people that, that want to like him, um, you know, for, for various reasons. And like, you can definitely find that stuff in his film and in his data. There's people that, you know, might be lower on him than consensus. And there's also areas like the, the pick sixes in that TCU game where, where you can point to that as well. And I, I think that holds true for, for most quarterbacks, but like, it, it's very significant for someone like JJ McCarthy, who is not regarded in like the top three quarterbacks on the consensus big board or, or among sta- scouts or even like some, some analytical models, but like in that next tier, like how do you kind of differentiate yourself? How do you kind of show that you're gonna, you, you know, you're gonna be able to perform at the next level. And I think, yeah, like some of that, that athletic ability based on his, his combine results, what we saw on film uh, from him at, at Michigan, as well as his, um, his, his ex- explosiveness, which we saw a lot in the TCU game, especially early in that game where he can, he can, as long as he can kind of translate that over that should hit, give him a little bit of a higher floor at the next level. Yeah. And in terms of translating that over, let's pivot a little bit from looking at his college career to what we kind of expect to go in his pro career. Are there any good comps that you have? Obviously those are always useful when talking about a player like this, especially when there's so much uncertainty. Are there any good comps that you have uh, for JJ McCarthy? Yeah. So I think that the the comp that I keep coming back to with him is he's right-handed Tua, where I think he has a similar level of arm strength to Tua, like enough to get the job done, but not like an overwhelming amount. He also has had some trouble processing from, you know, people who I really respect in the scouting world uh, have said that on like various YouTube videos or on Twitter. Um, but I think like the, you know, the, the ability to, to move around in the pocket, the efficiency that we saw from both Tua and McCarthy in college and, and like what we saw from them in their national championship games. And in particular, like he could be a top eight EPA per play quarterback in the right offense, but 
he seems more dependent on his surroundings than probably other quarterbacks in this draft, just because of that uncertainty that we talked about. And then maybe some of that development curve that that's going to happen for him at the next level. So it's kind of like that double-edged sword there where like, I think, I think he can be pretty good and, and probably have a, a relatively high floor in the league. And then that ceiling can really come in if the infrastructure is right around him on the team he gets drafted to. Yeah. And I think you kind of hit the nail on the head there talking about the infrastructure. Um, I, the more I watch him in terms of just, you know, physical traits, technique, I, I can't get Desmond Ritter out of my head. And I think Desmond Ritter, I, I think he had a good, a lot of good players around him in Atlanta um, in terms of the infrastructure, you know, they ended up moving on from a, from a head coach and, and th there was a lot going on there. Um, it obviously still a young player, but I just can't get Desmond Ritter out of my head in terms of just a pure, you know, how did these two players look their last year in college? They very much resemble each other. Um, what's interesting is that McCarthy's consensus big board ranking prior to really this kind of combine rise where we've seen him get pinned almost at the second pick, uh, according to certain NFL insiders, they're very similar in that kind of 30 to 40 range end of the first round, you know, consensus big board rating. You don't know if he's going to be a second or a third round pick based on where the quarterbacks go and who needs quarterbacks and who takes a shot. But they were in that very similar range before McCarthy obviously took off to kind of the 9-10 range that he sits now. You look at the, the scouting reports that are public, particularly the ones on NFL.com, and they're remarkably similar between Desmond Ritter and J.J. McCarthy. They both note for each, they have a wind up in their delivery, average, modest arm strength, you know, sluggish getting through the progressions, which we've talked a little bit about. They're elusive on the ground, but the average elusiveness may cause problems at the NFL level where there's bigger, faster players. The remarkably similar scouting reports. That being said, the major difference, and I think what separates McCarthy into, you know, a different top tier of prospect than Ritter is when pressured McCarthy's shown ability to not get sacked. That was kind of Ritter's thing at that level. So I, I think that kind of separates him into a different tier in terms of projection rather than just physical traits. And that's why I look at a guy like Geno Smith, who has performed pretty well for the Seahawks, you know, been a guy who can shoulder a lot of load on an offense and win eight, nine, 10 games. And I, I think if I'm projecting out and just saying, you know, on average, this player is going to be similar to this person. That's why I go with Geno Smith there. Yeah, no, that's, I, I really like, you know, both of those comps and like, I think obviously Desmond Ritter's NFL play level, it will cloud a little bit of your first comp. Like, yeah, you're right. You look at both of them in college and you even go back to like the, the winner thing that we were talking about earlier, where it's like, yeah, both of these guys, like I think never lost a home game their entire collegiate careers. Like, like for both of them to do that, you know, on top of, of the, the other scouting report similarities. Like, I think, I think that is something really interesting uh, to mention. And I do like the, the Geno Smith uh, aspect as well. And like the wind up delivery, I think is like an interesting perspective on all this, because when we think about like the next stage of, you know, what analytics can be in the draft process, like, and I know our friend Quinn has done some work on this publicly where you think about like using computer vision to apply it to the biomechanics or the mechanics of, of players as they are operating. Like you think about his, like how quickly he gets the ball from his last pat to release and like how that could project to the next level. If we had data on that and maybe there was a correlation there or like, you know, people talked about Justin Fields is um, throwing motion, not being conducive to NFL success. And, you know, I think a lot of those people ended up being right. Whereas like I, when I was looking at the data on fields, like I ended up being, being more wrong about that. So like, it'll be cool to see that uh, kind of play out these next couple of years. But the question I had for you is when you hear a report, like JJ McCarthy might be considered to go number two overall. And we've been looking at consensus big board rankings and, and we've been, you know, kind of getting all that information together. Like how do you weed out what could be a smoke screen? What could be true and what they would want us to think is a smoke screen, but like actually like an uh, active play by them. Like how do you kind of usually handle that during draft season? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question because obviously there is a lot of jockeying and, and when you look at kind of the draft as a structure, I mean, there's a restricted class of players. There's a restricted number of picks. 
Um, and, and so, you know, teams are, are going to be willing to try to, you know, decrease the value of a certain pick or increase the value of a certain player. So maybe someone falls to them. It's all kind of a, a value play. And I think you have to take it with a grain of salt, especially in a class where there are four quarterbacks that, you know, half of the reports or 75% of the reports or, or something like that think those players could suitably go in the top five, top six, top 10 picks. So it, I think it's more of kind of a, a jockey play and, and it's tough to know which, you know, reporters are, are saying something from the analytics, which reporters are building something based off of things they know of teams, uh, betters who are, you know, moving the market based on, on what they expect and, and the casinos moving the lines. I think when you you really have to keep a thirty thousand foot view at at all times and and kind of stick to the wisdom of the crowds because any one kind of shift may have too much information from one team and not enough from the team that matters or something like that. But you keep yeah. you keep looking at the consensus big board. You know he's at at nine or ten. Uh, our friend Benjamin Robinson has him at seven EDP. You know I, I think that makes kind of a. a a good marker of his value at this point. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think the point that you brought up there, where it's like, it really does only take one team. And you think about some of the research that has been done in the past about how in the draft steals usually don't actually end up being steals, but reaches do end up performing like reaches because yeah, the wisdom of the crowd is so important there where if the entire league passes on someone once or, or maybe even twice, like there's, you know, the chances are they know something uh, that's pushing them down their the cons- relative to the consensus big board. But all it takes is is one team to truly reach on a player and mm-hmm. take them 10, 20 spots ahead of where they're taken. And, you know, it ends up becoming like a, a pretty uneven distribution because of that in regards to, um, you know, how, how that performance ends up happening with these, these steals and reaches at the next level. But yeah, I mean, the, the grind in the box of, uh, you know, having JJ McCarthy at seven feels feels right because, you know, if he doesn't end up going number four overall, like if there is a player that, uh, you know, if the Cardinals end up staying there, there's there's no trade up by like a team like the Vikings or the Giants or or anything, and they and they don't end up, he doesn't end up going four overall. Like, it, it, who knows how far he'll he'll drop off? So his median is 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 seven, but you know, you could see his. Uh, you know, his, his, his highest even V2, if those reports are correct, or he could even slip. Like, I think, again, like that range is is pretty uh, wide in regards to his draft position. And we'll, we'll end up seeing it on, on draft night. And, you know, I, for, for my money, and, and we don't bet at, at Sumer, obviously, but like, I still think just gut feeling wise that Drake May will be the, the quarterback taken number two overall, just because like, again, you look at the consensus big boards and how that's usually predictive of actual draft position. You look at some of the data or or what scouts say about him, and, and you can make the case for that. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if Jaden Daniels was the number two pick. I, I would be more surprised if it wasn't one of those two guys at, at number two overall. But it, it'll be really interesting to follow down the stretch here. Yeah, you bring up a great point about it being it, all it taking is one team. And so obviously they have to consider a lot of things about fit, culture, you know, standpoint where they want to compete in the next two years, whether they're still building their team. So based off some of those factors, what do you think the best fit for McCarthy is moving forward? Yeah. I mean, I, I think the obvious one, I hope I'm not stealing this explanation from you is, is the Vikings. Like, I think that again, when we talk about infrastructure and we talk about supporting cast, there are not many better places to walk into than Minnesota where you have Justin Jefferson, Jordan Addison, TJ Hawkinson coming back from injury. You have two franchise tackles. Um, you know, you can beef up your interior offensive line, but like just across the board, like that's a great place to walk into. And I think Kevin O'Connell is a really good play caller. The other one I think would be would be Miami. And, you know, I, I think that Tua can can run that offense offense efficiently. Like we've seen that uh, you know, each of the the last two years, especially early in the season, like their offense is really efficient, but it's, it's more of a debate of, do you want to pay to a, uh, you know, a, a middle of the market deal, like 40, 45 million versus kind of resetting everything with, with the rookie quarterback, which will allow you to, to bring in more free agents. And maybe he can operate the offense at at least, 
70, 80% of, of what Tua can. And then you're hoping maybe it can reach like the 100, 110% mark. So I think those would be two good fits for him. You know, one uh, at the beginning of the draft, but also one team that would need to trade up to get him. Yeah. And, and completely independent of, of, your analysis i also highlighted the vikings and the dolphins just in terms of where they sit currently as teams obviously the vikings had an injury riddled year last year decided to move on from kirk cousins um i i think that it makes sense to say you know kirk cousins is an aging quarterback and we think this player probably could generate more upside in our building with all these great players and with a coach that we trust and have trusted for for several years now um, I think that's a great situation for him. By far the best fit from both parties. In terms of the Dolphins, if if I'm the Dolphins, and this is interesting, I talked about this on the Analytics with Asa podcast. Asa, who asked a question here, is it, they have a potential to be the first kind of quote slash and burn uh, quarterback type, uh, take that approach with quarterback because Tua is sitting there on his fifth year option. And if you have them graded the same and you're in that building, it probably makes sense to just not pay to a 25, $30 million and instead just play a, a rookie wage salary to JJ McCarthy, especially if you think they're, they're kind of even in players. And obviously you'd be able to progress uh, JJ under Mike McDaniel and that awesome offensive staff they have there. One that I thought was in the mix though, obviously they traded for Sam Howell was the Seahawks. I think he would have been a great fit with the Seahawks. Um, it's tough to say now. Um, obviously they traded a little bit of draft capital for Howell. Um, it, it, it's tough to gauge. It's tough to gauge if, if, are they willing to, to pick a use premier draft capital, given that they have a Geno Smith and a Sam Howell, two guys that got starter snaps last year and kind of bet on that upside and let them, let them sit for a year or two and, and maybe reap the benefits of that going forward. Obviously Eric Eager, uh, consumer sports did a piece where you know they didn't really show wasn't super predictive of whether or not that would improve a player like McCarthy in that situation um obviously they're in a, a place where they're not it's not a shoe in like the Vikings or the Dolphins in terms of the cap and the roster um but that's another interesting one that I thought would fit structurally well but obviously they have two quarterbacks on the roster right now yeah, I do. I do think that one could have been good. Like I, I did think that going into draft season, the Seahawks could have been one of those Rattler, Penix, Knicks teams that like take them in the second round and kind of have them sit behind Geno Smith. But yeah, I mean, it, you identified like the the Mike McDonald, JJ McCarthy connection there, which could have been cool before they traded for uh, Howell. But yeah, I mean, I, I think like even going a little bit further in the draft, the Broncos or Raiders could be teams that that maybe they're the team that ends up moving up to the, the four spot and taking them. Like I, I do believe the Broncos will make a move at some point to, to get a quarterback, whether it's it's signing someone, trading or or drafting someone and, and just kind of seeing um you know what they can do from that perspective. The the Raiders are, you know, a team that I think has has promised Gardner Minshew, like at least he can compete for the starting job, but like maybe they want to uh you know have someone come in to, to kind of like compete with him or, or to sit behind him for a year. Or so, so those would be interesting ones to watch as well. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And so let's take it kind of, we're having this discussion four or five years down the road, pre-draft. What would you expect that we have just discussed about uh, JJ McCarthy? What do you think is in his future four years from now? What's kind of the, the overwhelming narrative four years from now? <laughs> So I think in, in four years from now, there will be a debate about a big debate between JJ McCarthy and whether he should get a top of the market extension, whether he should get a, a mid range quarterback extension or, or whether the team should, should move on from him and draft a rookie quarterback, you know, kind of square one for where some of these teams that we just talked about are right now. And I think he's going to be included in those discussions pretty quickly because I think you know, if he does end up getting drafted to that good situation that we talked about, he should rank pretty highly from an efficiency standpoint, should be pretty productive, but I'm sure some of the, the film will always be a little bit up and down with, with the inconsistencies he has, um, you know, some of the, the issues he has with, with like putting together full games or, or full uh, workloads. So I think that'll be, uh, you know, a, a fun debate to have in, in four years about him. 
Yeah, for sure. Uh, in a similar manner, I can I can see him kind of going that Baker way potentially, where he's on a good team. You know, he's played decently well. He, he's won some games and and been okay, efficient. Um, but maybe that team just thinks that they can do better, and and he gets moved on. He maybe bounces around to another team, but. Ultimately, I think you said it well, is that if he has a good supporting cast around him, he's probably proven in college that he can be pretty efficient and not, you know, really hurt you, take, take care of the ball, not take sacks, etc. So realistically, I think he's probably in the same spot that Tua is now, maybe playing out a fifth year option uh, or maybe, you, you know, do we pay him? Do we not pay him? Like you said, a, a great example of this i think would be interesting if i'm his agent to watch is the purdy situation obviously purdy's a seventh round pick uh not a that won't wouldn't have a fifth year option but you know what what do the 49ers do with purdy given that he's a player that's performed very well been extremely efficient uh they believe him and believe in him took him to a super bowl but you know you may be able to upgrade and and if the draft is there or the free agents are there uh, a wandering eye may come about. And so I think you should take a look at that Purdy situation because I think that's something that McCarthy could be in, especially if he goes to a team like the Vikings, with that, which has a Justin Jefferson, a TJ Hawkinson, or something like that. Yeah, I like that a lot, actually. I didn't even think about that comparison, but I, I could see something very similar to, to that discussion in the future. Yep. So that concludes kind of our breakdown of JJ McCarthy. I again, encourage you to go read the tour of the top four piece, which has a lot more in detail links, basically a great Wikipedia summary. I like to call it of JJ McCarthy's career up till now, as always on the class play, we want to make some class play picks of our favorite draftees of all time. So this week we're doing offensive linemen. Tay, who's one of your favorite offensive linemen picks of all time. So, um, I, I'm going to go with Laramie Tunzel here because I think, you know, I think his, his story is, is pretty crazy, right? Where, where you think about someone who was a five-star top of his class coming out of high school, um, you know, he got an offer from every single SEC school. So you're looking at, at Florida, but they had DJ Humphreys and you're, and you're looking at, at Georgia and, you know, it, you know, it didn't work out for him there. And so like, he, he looks towards Ole Miss, he shows up on Ole Miss's campus, you know, something happens when he's on Ole Miss's campus, he ends up enrolling there. And, um, you know, he's, he's someone who can, who can start pretty quickly and, and, um, you know, play well, but then when he had his, his junior season, it did actually come out that, you know, he, that he, he accepted, um, you know, some benefits to, to join Ole Miss or to, you know, to get, get, uh, benefits from an agent when he was going to the NFL, like, you know, there's some story involved in there. So, so he was suspended for, for the first half of his junior year. First game back from his suspension, he has to line up against, uh, you know, eventual number one overall pick, Miles Garrett. And the, the Ole Miss wins 23 to, to three in that game, where I think by a lot of, you know, people who, who really studied this game, like Tunzel was the big winner in that game. And that was big in, in him, him ending up being number one on the consensus big board. When you look back at his draft year, of course, the gas mask video comes out on draft night. I, I remember this vividly where uh you know he he was projected to be number one overall or at least in the top three and could you know and i think like you know people were saying he could be one of the best offensive tackles in the league but you know, the the trade happened and then and then the um the, the video came out so it dropped him in the draft but like he's gone on to have such a good career that people i think have, have largely forgot about the gas mess video or not have thought about it as the first thing that comes to mind with him. Like he's, he's not infamous for that video anymore. I think he's someone that has, has played well enough for both the dolphins and Texans where he has now become uh, recognized for her, for his high level of play. Yeah, I, I, th I definitely agree. I think, you know, especially depending on how the growth of CJ Stroud goes. And I think obviously Tunzel as that, protector of, of Stroud on the offensive line will play a major part of this. But I think that you could be looking at Laramie Tunsil moving on to a Hall of Fame type career. Um, at a higher level, obviously, I think just by writing a story about Laramie Tunsil, you could write a story about, you know, the culture shifts, the, so, the socio, um, so, socioeconomic or however you want to approach it 
plays of the 2010 and, and the changes in the 2010, you could really just look at him going to Ole Miss. Obviously now we have NIL in the system and, and guys are realistically getting paid for, for what they're doing on the field. The time that wasn't, that was illegal. You, you look at some of the changes that have been made in, in laws across the United States, uh, social media, obviously there's a bunch of good articles about what was actually going on during that, that draft day. You look at social media and the way it can realistically change the narrative, change the draft in you know, a 15 to 20 minute period where a player goes from being a lock to at least go top three to dropping down. And obviously you look at a player now who is probably going to have a Hall of Fame career after all of that happening to him. I think that's a, a really great pick, not only from a football perspective, but more from a sociocultural perspective as well. Um, in a similar kind of vein, though, this player wasn't directly involved in a lot of stuff. One of my favorite players to watch throughout the 2010s was Marquise Pouncey, you know, a center uh, coming from those fantastic Florida Gator teams, some of the most talented players of all time. Obviously, a lot of stories uh, with Tim Tebow and, and Aaron Hernandez and all kinds of uh, other stories coming about Urban Meyer or about that team. Um, but this is a guy who similarly was just successful, just got it done at the next level. You, you look at his his accolades and they're they're quite filled to the brim. Two time first team all pro, three time second team all pro, nine time Pro Bowl, 2010s all decade team, all rookie team. BCS National Championship, Remington Trophy, Consensus All-American, first team All-SEC. All this is a guy who got just got it done in the face of, you know, a lot of stuff going on. And I think that's where Tunsil and Pouncey are probably good picks. And if you had an offensive line and you had those two guys, I guarantee you'd have a pretty good offensive line. Yeah, that's a that's a great pick. I mean, yeah, that Swamp Kings documentary, um, you know, I, I think was was a little bit watered down of like what was going on at Florida at the time. But like you could really see like the, the impact that players like Pouncey had on that that roster and like how how this Florida team was was built for for all the success that they had. So I love that pick as well. Appreciate that. So want to thank everyone for jumping in the chat and watching today. Uh, as I said at the top, we have a piece up on Sumer Sports, the, to the tour of the top four J.J. McCarthy entry. We'll be covering Drake May. We'll be covering Jaden Daniels. We'll be covering, obviously, the, the consensus big board number one right now, Caleb Williams, in the next coming weeks. Make sure to follow along with us on Twitter. We'll be doing three more podcasts just like this one uh, in the coming three weeks, and you can check us out on Sumer Sports. Tej, any last words? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very excited to talk Drake May next week. I think that'll be another great episode. And, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm pumped for the, the rest of your top four preview it's, it reads really well so i encourage everyone to check out that article on sumersports.com yep and from Tej, seth and sam brookhouse we thank you for coming and we invite you to come back